Welcome to a very special episode of Brandon Avat. One of our special guests is Rebecca Tuval at Rhodes University. She's been on the show twice and we have a very close friendship. And she recently asked me if I knew anyone who'd be good to speak on the topic of pandemic ethics. And I thought the perfect person would, of course, be the world's most influential philosopher, Peter Singer. How did that go, Mark? Well, first of all, to both of our surprise, Peter Singer said yes. To our even greater surprise, after he said yes, a massive campaign was launched to cancel his talk. A number of people were concerned about Peter Singer's writing in the 1970s about the ethical treatment of terminally ill infants. And because of this, they thought that it would be wrong for him to speak on a Zoom call at Rhodes University, and it was felt that it would not be safe for the students on campus. The philosophy department took the view that it was their obligation to ensure that the talk took place. At Brain and Avat, we believe that free speech and the free flow of ideas and the ability for academics to discuss their views without being censored is very important, which is why we run this channel. You'll probably notice in all of our discussions with all of our guests, we disagree with them and we take a stance against their view almost always. But just because we disagree with what someone says doesn't mean we think they should be censored. And especially that is the case if what they said was said in the 1970s, that shouldn't preclude them from being able to talk about their views today on totally unrelated topics. So that's why we felt it was important to air this show. If you'd like to know more about this debacle, you can look at the links in the description below to articles written on Daily News and Brian Leiter's Leiter Reports. What you're about to watch is an interview amongst Rebecca Tuval, Dan Cullen, Eric Sampson, and Peter Singer. They discuss the underlying controversy and they speak about Singer's views on the pandemic. Peter Singer is the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University. Just recently, recipient of the Bergruen Prize for advancing ideas that shape the world. Prominent among those, is an argument and a movement for what he is called effective altruism. Professor Singer, you are widely regarded as the most influential philosopher on the planet, which makes my task easier because to cite all your works would take too much time away from our conversation. Much of your influence has to do with the fact that you believe grappling with controversial ideas is an essential responsibility of philosophy. And yet, you know that you have critics who accuse you of responsibility, of irresponsibility, and indeed much worse. Rebecca? Hi, everyone. Hi, Peter. Thanks for being here. So following up from what Dan said, while our panel is on pandemic ethics, and we don't want to divert attention away from that topic too much, we do want to give you an opportunity to address the controversy over your visit. As you know, there have been calls among some faculty and students for the cancellation of this webinar due to interpretations of your position on an unrelated topic. Is there anything that you would like this community to know uh, in regard to the backlash over your invitation? Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about that, Rebecca. Uh, Yes, I do have some things to say. Uh, it's relevant here that uh, last year, together with uh, Francesca Minerva and Jeff McMahon, I founded uh, the Journal of Controversial Ideas to prevent the stifling of well-reasoned but unpopular ideas. The idea of the journal is that it will provide a forum in which people can publish controversial ideas in well-argued papers under a pseudonym so that they need not fear doing irreparable damage to their career, nor that they'll be subjected to personal vilification or perhaps threats of physical harm or real physical harm. All of our papers will be peer reviewed by experts in the field before being accepted for publication. The calls from our faculty at Rhodes for the invitation to me to be withdrawn demonstrate the need for such a journal. These calls seek to prevent the expression of views that the authors of these statements clearly haven't thought about for five minutes. I challenge those who find my views so abhorrent to say clearly what their own position is regarding abortion following a prenatal diagnosis that reveals a severe disability. Or parental decisions to seek the withdrawal of life support from an infant in hospital who will have a severe disability. Or for that matter, we could ask the same question about vaccinating girls against, a rebe against rubella, uh, 
a disease that is pretty harmless in itself and wouldn't be worth vaccinating against, but of course causes serious congenital abnormalities in children if it occurs during pregnancy. These choices express exactly the same attitude to having a child with a serious disability as parents' choice to end the life of a newborn infant with a severe disability. All of these measures seek to prevent the existence of such a child. Last year in Poland, half a million people, mostly women, turned out in protest against a ruling by the Polish Constitutional Court prohibiting abortion on the grounds that a serious disability has been detected in the fetus. The protesters were trying to defend the right to terminate a pregnancy in order to avoid having a child with a disability. And there were women with disabilities themselves who were joining in that protest. The rhetoric used by faculty who object to me being able to speak at Rhodes suggests that they would support a ruling by the US Supreme Court, similar to that of the Polish Constitutional Court. Do they? I hope that they'll express their own views on that question. Thank you for the chance to comment on this issue. I think we all acknowledge that this is an important issue and it, and it certainly deserves uh, more than another session and the philosophy department is happy to participate in that and, and arrange it. But we do have a topic for today that we think is also of tremendous importance and that our students in particular are uh, both curious and, and excited about, and we think it's our responsibility as, as teachers to, to continue with this, with this program as we, as we intended. So let me begin Professor Singer, uh, by asking you about this, you, you are an Australian that, um, is no secret, uh, given your, your accent. And so you've, you've been able to experience the pandemic response in both, uh, your home country and, and the United States in the beginning lockdowns seem to be the obvious thing to do. Um, uh, and Australia indeed seemed to actually crush the spread of, of the virus early on, but, uh, I gather you've You've suggested that, uh, lockdowns aren't, um, obviously, uh, justifiable or be beyond uh, a certain point. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the, the complications there. Yes, uh, you're right. I think they're not obviously justifiable and that's an important word to put in. Um, I think the political leaders who are engaging in lockdowns are essentially engaging in guesswork about whether the costs uh, will or will not exceed the benefits. And in saying that, I'm not saying that they've made the wrong guess. Um, they may well have made the right guess, and I'll say just a little bit more about that in a moment. But we don't really have a method of balancing the, the costs and benefits. We, we do know that lockdowns will save some lives. They will save the lives of people who will, would get COVID if it was not for those lockdowns and some of them would die, but we don't know exactly what the costs are. It's been suggested, for example, that when you have a lockdown, people don't go to the doctors for more routine things like medical checkups, like maybe getting screened uh, in Australia, skin cancer is a big issue, for example. So people regularly get screened for strange marks that appear on their skin, some of which might turn into melanomas. So under lockdowns, fewer people were doing that. That might mean that in a few years, more people die from those skin cancers. Um, probably it's not going to amount to the number of people who would die from, from COVID, but it's a factor. On top of that, you've got to consider, uh, the, the damage to children's education when they're getting educated online and that damage will be done, especially to people from disadvantaged backgrounds who may not even have the ability to do the learning online, or certainly won't have the space and the quiet room in which to study that uh, better off people will. So, um, if you have long lockdowns, some children's prospects could be irreparably damaged by loss of, of that education opportunity, social costs, of course, in not mixing, um, 
unemployment, which uh, causes economic hardship, can also cause depression. There were some studies showing that there's more domestic violence during lockdowns. So we don't really have the methodology even to add up these different things and to compare, if you like, the, the apples and oranges uh, that are involved. And I think we, we do have to try to make those calculations and we should be doing more work along those lines. But let me make one other thing as you began with the difference between Australia and the United States. I think in Australia, certainly the early lockdowns were justified because we did, as you say, manage to crush the virus. Um, we actually had the chance of getting rid of it. Um, and we had some months where there were no lockdowns in Australia and things were back to normal. Unfortunately, because we were taking some international visitors and some Australian citizens coming back to Australia, uh, although we were requiring them to quarantine, we did have a leakage out of the quarantine facilities that has now led to the Delta variant being in Australia. And it doesn't look like we're going to be able to crush that as effectively. But if you do have a chance of doing that, I think it's worth going into lockdown. And Australia's uh, fatality rate from the virus is still extremely low. You know, we, we've had, um, just putting it in deaths per million to, to equalize the population. We're currently at 49 deaths per million. The United States is at over 2,000 deaths per million. So our lockdowns have certainly kept down the fatality rate. And, and I would, that's why I would say those early lockdowns were well justified. Um, but, you know, when the virus is there and you've got to a point where you can't control it, it becomes more doubtful uh, whether the lockdowns are justifiable. And that's why generally here in the U.S. they, they seem to have eased off. Right. But our mo mortality rate is significantly higher than in that of Australia. You... Your mention of the calculations uh, suggested how how complex all of that would be. We we seem though as a as a public to just um, operate on the on the recognition that um, the cure can be worse than than the disease. But as as you know, we had an enormous polarization, especially in the United States, over over the question of lockdowns, and and so it seemed then that you know, vaccination and, and mandatory vaccination would be our escape from, from the dilemma of, of lockdowns. But now obviously we have an intense controversy about the propriety of, of mandatory vaccination. So is that, uh, also obviously justifiable? Are there some circumstances in which it would not be? So I have a, a clearer view about the justifiability of, of vaccine mandates. Um, I do think that they're justifiable. Um, I accept that there is to, in some, in one sense, a restriction of individual freedom to, to choose whether they get vaccinated or not. And therefore I would say if people do not wish to mix with other people, if they're prepared to stay isolated, um, I would not require them to get vaccinated. But very few people really are going to be prepared to do that in the long run. And if they're unvaccinated, but they do insist on mixing with others, going to the cinema or restaurants, using public transport, going to sporting events, um, then they are posing an increased risk to other people. And in a sense, they're, they're denying the freedom of other people to attend those events uh, who are at particularly high risk. So other people may judge given that I'll be mingling with unvaccinated people, I'm not going to go to this event because let's say I'm elderly or I have an underlying health condition and I will be at high risk of dying from COVID. So this is a balancing of freedoms. This is not just a question of restricting freedom for some, it's a balancing of the freedoms of some and others. And in my judgment, the infringement of freedom in saying to people, if you want to mingle with other people and go to these events, you need to get vaccinated. Uh, that's the lesser freedom. That's, that's the smaller cost rather than, uh, having these people pose a risk to others that they mix with. And, and so do you think that a, a vaccine passport is another sort of reasonable, um, compromise, so to speak, if, so not requiring a vaccination for those who have whatever reasons to resisted, but just acknowledging the logic of uh, the position you 
you just spelled out, you can't, you can't insist on both not vaccinating yourself and be able, being able to continue about your ordinary business. But there some, some critics have suggested that uh, a vaccine passport might in some ways be worse than the, than the mandate that it's, it's new territory, uh, toward the direction of a, of a social credit system perhaps. And is that, is that perhaps a reason to, to rethink the the option of the vaccine pass for it as, um, as a, as a more moderate alternative to mandating. No, I think it's, it's, um, an excessive suspicion of government. If, uh, citizens of the United States, just to take a, as an example, really fear that by introducing vaccine passports to deal with this particular pandemic emergency situation, uh, we're going to go the way of, uh, you know, social credit passports, if you like, or cards, um, which it's been suggested is a, is a development that's underway in, in China. Um, you know, we don't have that sort of government. We do have far more freedoms. We guard these freedoms. Um, but I think we could be too stringent in guarding them. And I think you have to allow, uh, reasonable measures, uh, like vaccine passports so that, uh, everybody can go about their business knowing that if they're in a certain environment where passports are required, uh, they are at very low risk of getting the virus. Right. Rebecca. Yeah, I just want to jump in here on uh, what you had to say about vaccine mandates. So imagine that the risk of an adverse reaction from taking the vaccine were much higher and the benefits lower. Would you still support a mandate? In other words, at what point would you no longer support a vaccine mandate? Uh, so I think if the risk was significantly higher, um, and if they were appro approaching the risks of getting the virus, then I would not require it. Um, then it would seem to me to be much more of a balanced choice. Um, you know, but, but we know that that's not the case with the vaccines that we have now. They have been used on, uh, you know, well, millions of, you know, tens of millions of people in, in the United States, um, uh, and, uh, globally, uh, I think we're over a billion, um, vaccines that have been given. So we, we have, uh, really very strong statistical evidence now, uh, about the low risk, not zero, but uh, very low risk, um, which is far lower than the risk of being exposed to the virus. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your, uh, your well-known views on wealth redistribution. So you're well-known for, for those views. So, uh, your view as as you've said in famine, affluence and morality is that, uh, the relatively wealthy individuals in developed countries have extensive obligations to use their wealth to help the global poor. But I'm wondering how, or if you think this view has applications for vaccine distribution between wealthy and developing countries, would you say something about whether we have such obligations? Yes, thank you. Um, I think that what we're seeing right now in vaccine distribution, um, simply, uh, reinforces and confirms what I've been saying for many decades about our failure to give adequate, uh, assistance to people in low income countries, including people who are at risk of dying from poverty related diseases, uh, or malnutrition, uh, conditions like that. Um, so just as we you know, comfortably live our own lives without giving anything very significant to, to foreign aid. Now, actually a lot of Americans, of course, don't realize this when you, when you ask Americans, what percentage of the federal budget do goes for foreign aid? Um, I saw uh, one study that said the median answer is 26%. Um, the actual answer is 1%. So Americans say they're against more foreign aid, but, but they think what foreign aid is 26 times higher than it is. So it's really hard to judge what Americans attitudes to foreign aid really would be if they were well informed, but, um, but yeah, we, you know, we give the United States gives very little. It's currently giving, I think 18 cents in every hundred dollars that the nation earns. Um, and, uh, there are some pri private donations that add a little bit to that, but it's still rather little. And then we see the same thing with, with vaccines now that, uh, the United States government is um, supporting the idea of, of booster shots for Americans who've already had two, uh, two shots of it. Um, and you know, that th there will be some health benefit from that. 
but it's a small health benefit compared to the benefit of getting vaccinated in the first place. And yet when we look at the low income countries in the world, um, those countries, according to the World Health Organization, are still below 3% of the population being vaccinated. So um, clearly we would be doing much more good if we were shipping out these vaccines that we're using as boosters to um, people in low income countries who haven't been able to get vaccinated at all. Um, I credit President Biden with saying that he was giving 500 million doses to low income countries a, a little while ago, but um, you know, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Um, and I think even in terms of the United States fair share, you could argue that as a, a large and wealthy nation, we should be giving more than 500 million doses. And certainly all affluent nations should be giving. Um, and, uh, you know, I include my own, uh, country of citizenship, Australia in this, uh, we should also be doing a lot more, um, in terms of, uh, donating vaccines to low income countries. Peter, could I follow up on. On an aspect of this, you, you referred to, um, the need to ship more vaccine to countries in, in need, but, uh, we're also talking about producing the vaccine in, in other countries. And, and the question has come up about safeguarding the intellectual property rights of the pharmaceutical companies who, who gave us the, the miracle drug. Um, do you think that, that that is a, is a legitimate uh, input into the, into the calculation of, of what to do in order to act equitably, because the argument is made that, you know, we have to think about the, the future consequences of a regime of intellectual property protection being weakened that may have a downstream effect on, on innovation. What's your the thinking about that? You know, the same argument was made in the case of the antiretrovirals for HIV AIDS. And eventually there, the argument was won for, um, allowing, uh, other countries to produce generic versions of the antiretrovirals and, and that program, um, which ultimately was supported, I have to say in the end by the United States, I think probably the best thing that George W. Bush did during his presidency, and he did many things that I think were drastically and catastrophically wrong, um, was his support for, uh, antiretrovirals and for aid against, uh, victims of HIV AIDS, uh, particularly in Africa. Um, and, uh, so I think we, sh we should be doing the same thing here. We should be allowing, um, countries to produce the vaccines themselves. Um, I think the, the companies that have manufactured the vaccine. Uh, well, for one thing, a lot of them got government money, um, for producing the vaccine. Uh, they also, uh, often drew on research sponsored by government research. Um, and I think that they, you know, the sales of vaccines to affluent countries will have reimbursed them and meant that, uh, their work was appropriately rewarded. I don't think it has to be further rewarded by, um, their protection of, of further intellectual property rights. So I think that with they, they should be now allowing, um, generic manufacture and supply for low income countries. And when I said they should be shipped out now, that's merely what would have, you know, get them there as quickly as possible. Um, but, uh, certainly in the longer run, uh, if they have the manufacturing capacity and can do that, then that would be the right thing to do. So that last one was a question about our obligations between countries. Now we have a question about uh, distribution within a country. So there are many criteria we might use to prioritize who gets the vaccine first. So we could prioritize first responders or the elderly or minimizing deaths, the number of deaths, minimizing the number of years lost, not necessarily deaths or first come first served and so on. Many ways to distribute the vaccine. Um, on what basis do you think people should be prioritized to receive the vaccine? Uh, I think the basis really should be to save the most life years, uh, rather than the most lives. But I, I would say that, uh, part of that would be, uh, giving priority to healthcare workers, um, because they're needed to save the lives of people who end up in, in hospitals and need, uh, healthcare workers to save their lives. So I would give them first priority. Um, after that, interestingly, although I said the number of life years saved, when you 
do the calculations and look at the extent to which older people are at a higher risk of dying, a substantially higher risk of dying than younger people, um, that does lead to the conclusion that we should vaccinate older people next. Um, and people with underlying health conditions that also uh, greatly increase their risk of, of dying from the virus. Um, because that, you know, there's quite a dramatic drop off in terms of risk of death as you get down from the older age groups. Uh, and that's why I think they should be the, the, the next group. Um, and only after that you move down the age years or you look at other workers who are also important, but not healthcare workers, um, uh, and give them the next batch. Can I just jump in here quickly? What about a proposal that suggested that we distribute the vaccine to people who are more likely to be spreaders? Uh, yeah, if we can identify those who are more likely to be spreaders, um, and if we're not rewarding bad behavior, that's the other question, right? So who are the people who are more likely to be spreaders? Are, are they the people who are going to go to big parties? Um, uh, well, I don't, I don't know that we want people to say, oh yes, I'm going to go to big parties. Um, so I need to get, um, I need to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, look, uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky question. I, 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 on the, that's one where I haven't really seen the figures of whether you would save more lives by vaccinating people of, you know, if you might say the party age generation, if that's a particular age group. Um, well, you, you could also get this information through cellular data. Uh-huh. Um, well, you could get the information as to whether they're going to, to mix with other people, whether to what extent they're spreading the virus and to what extent that leads to the virus being spread to high risk people. I mean, it, it, it probably would, right? I mean, initially they're going to spread it to other people of their own age group who are at low risk, but then those people have parents and grandparents, um, and it will spread. So I suppose if you really produced convincing evidence that this was going to save more lives and more life years than directly vaccinating older people, um, I'd, I'd be persuaded, um, somewhat reluctantly, but I'd be persuaded that that was the way to go. Uh, but if that data exists, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I can't help but but notice it's it's almost almost quaint that we can uh, think our way back to the beginning when we did have some some really urgent questions about uh, who's first in in the queue. Our situation now is we we can't seem to give the the virus away. The and that vaccine. Is, yeah. yeah the, sorry, the vaccine. <laughs> yes, we're giving the virus away <laughs> um, as we speak. The, uh, the, just recently a directive was, was issued to doctors that they should, they should not give monoclonal antibody treatment. I'm pretending I, I understand that for, uh, for the purpose of the argument should not give it to uh, hospitalized patients who had been vaccinated, but save it, save it for the unvaccinated. That struck many people as intolerable. I, I imagine, uh, the justification is the unvaccinated are, are going to be in, in even worse situation and we shouldn't make discriminations when we have patients who show up on our doorstep, but you've already opened the door to underlying behavior, perhaps being a, a consideration in treatment. What do you, what do you think of that? of that whole kerfuffle risk. I think, I think it's, it's difficult, uh, because yes, you don't want to reward people for what I see as, uh, you know, being foolish. Um, I know, you know, some people have, have said when, uh, certain right-wing talk show hosts, uh, who had sort of, uh, you know, declaimed against the, the, the vaccine and, uh, said that COVID is just like flu and it wasn't something to worry about, uh, when they got COVID and died, uh, some people said, well, this is Darwinian selection at work. We're, we're weeding out the stupid in the community. Um, that's really pretty callous. I have to say, you know, um, it's not that I have much sympathy for these talk show hosts in general, but, um, to actually sort of say that it's, it's fine that somebody dies because they've made a stupid mistake. Um, I don't think we should be doing that. Um, so yeah. If you have been vaccinated, the risk that you will 
really have a very serious case of COVID and that you will die is very much lower than if you haven't been vaccinated. Um, it's not, again, it's not zero, but it's, it's very much lower. So I think it probably does make sense to avoid the tragedy of more deaths, um, as a result of this kind of foolishness. Um, I think it does make sense to do that. Um, you know, there's, there's a parallel example where I think, um, uh, there's an opportunity, if you like, for second thoughts. Um, and that's the use of, um, liver transplants for people who are heavy drinkers. So, um, people who are very heavy drinkers over many years, destroy their liver, and then they show up at hospital and they need a liver transplant and, and, uh, livers are in scarce supply and they can be donated. People can do living people can donate a liver lobe, a part of a liver, or you can get livers from people who've been killed in road accidents and so on, but they're definitely scarce. So there was an argument that you shouldn't give them to the heavy drinkers, um, because they brought it on themselves and other people have liver diseases that in a way they couldn't have prevented. But, um, I think the best answer there is to say, if you're a heavy drinker, um, you get one more chance. You do get a liver or a liver lobe, um, and you get a very strong talking to about your drinking. And if you continue to drink and you destroy that liver and come back for a second one, no, that's too late. You can't be that resource intensive in your use and deprive other people from it. Now, in the case of COVID, I guess there isn't really this sort of second chance because if you've had COVID, you're probably not going to get it again. Um, but I would say it's, it's like the first chance. And just as I would give the, the liver to, for the first time to the heavy drinkers, I would give the monoclonal antibodies to, um, the people who haven't been vaccinated and, and, you know, assuming that they're in short supply. Um, that would mean that some of the vaccinated people wouldn't get it, but they would, you know, almost virtually all of them would recover without it. But does this suggest that the public, the public's intuitions aren't really, uh, in line with utilitarian thinking because imputation of, of personal responsibility, uh, seems to, seems to trump just the, the calculation of where the most need is and, and what a, what a general long-term consequences is going to be. And there's an awful lot of anger in, in the public that it, it seems to me your utilitarian perspective would, would suggest we, we should be able to transcend by, by taking a somewhat broader view, but people are, are stuck with, uh, what they, what they seem to think are quite profound intuitions, including that, you know, a vaccine mandate is, is tyrannical and, and completely unacceptable in a, in a free society. Yes. I, um, in general, I don't think our intuitions are a very reliable guide to what's the right thing to do. Um, uh, and that's the case for the intuition that vaccine mandates are tyrannical, but it's also the case for the intuition that we should punish people who don't do the right thing. And therefore we shouldn't, uh, uh, give the monoclonal antibodies to those who are unvaccinated. Um, and you know, this is also, I think the, the intuition behind, uh, the, the use of the death penalty, it's kind of, a, it's a form of retribution. It clearly doesn't all the statistics show that it's not an, a, a uniquely effective deterrent. Um, but people still want to see it or some people want to want to see it. Not everybody, of course. And I think that this is a, um, you know, many of our intuitions here are evolved responses that we, or our ancestors rather developed over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years living uh, in small social groups where the group itself benefited and had enhanced chances of survival if it punished wrongdoers. And if you develop this strong sense that somebody who does something wrong has to be severely punished, um, perhaps even killed. Uh, and I think that, uh, we're not living in those circumstances anymore. Um, I think our society can actually be a better society if we are somewhat more understanding of why people make mistakes in their behavior and do the wrong things. Um, and for that reason, we can give monoclonal antibodies to people who have made mistakes about, uh, getting vaccinated. Rebecca. Yeah, I think I would just like to go back a bit to the question about Australia and the U S and, and really ask you more specifically, 
exactly what you think like the biggest ethical failures that governments have made during the pandemic. Perhaps. Uh, green, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so I, let me speak about Australia, whereas I was there during the, the pandemic. Um, and I think uh, the biggest ethical failure Australia made actually was not foreseeing the need for effective quarantine facilities on a large scale. Um, because what this meant was that uh, initially the government prevented people coming back to Australia, and they still are to some extent, including Australian citizens. So Australian citizens who, let's say, were uh, living in India, or they might have been Australian citizens visiting relatives in India. Um, where, when, the, when the pandemic hit India, and it hit India very, very hard, as you remember, and there were lots of deaths, they could not return to Australia at that time, um, despite being Australian citizens. Now, the, the Australian government was saying, well, you've got to quarantine for two weeks um, bef because otherwise you'll bring the, the, the Delta variant into Australia, which is perfectly true. But, um, you know, we have a large country. Um, we have a lot of space. Uh, we could build large quarantine facilities um, in areas quite remote from the major cities and make sure that that quarantine really worked effectively. Uh, and the government didn't do that. It was too slow to do that. And that's why we now have, uh, the Delta variant in Australia. And as I said, we have, you know, lockdowns in the biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, and we're not getting rid of it. So that seems to me the, the big mistake. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you go back to the United States, then, then clearly the, the Trump administration played down the dangers of the virus for far too long when it had information that the virus was, uh, really serious. Um, and it didn't close things off. Now, maybe it's harder to, to close, um, immigration in the United States, uh, than it is in Australia because Australia is an island, um, and the United States is, is not, you would have people coming across the land borders. But, um, yeah, I, I think although some measures were taken, I think particularly against China and um, people coming from China, uh, other measures were not taken, um, promptly enough. And I think that led to the virus being much more widespread here than it would have been. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. So just on this issue. So one concern about the, the way, you know, Australia and other countries have handled it is that it's too authoritarian. So that the, the, the state is exercising too much authority over, uh, individuals. So there's a question here about, um, parents and children. So we're, we're not vaccinating children, uh, on a, in a wide, on a wide scale just yet, but eventually we, we may well do that. And it may be the case that, you know, there are some kids who would very much like to get the vaccine, but their parents don't want them to get it for whatever reason. So there's this question about whether or not um, kids should be able, whether the government should allow uh, kids to be vaccinated against their parents' will. So in the, when there's a conflict between uh, kids' wishes and the parents' will with respect to the, the vaccination, do you think the government should step in and go ahead and vaccinate that child? Or do you think that uh, the government ought to let parents make a decision about that? that issue? Well, I, I, I think most of the country has had uh, vaccination mandates for children attending school. Um, I can remember doing that uh, many years ago when I was visiting the US and uh, I think we were living in, in the Washington suburbs in Virginia and uh, we had school aged children and uh, they had to show vaccination status before being admitted to the local schools. Uh, and um, so I, I suppose this, the same thing can apply if, if parents uh, want to apply to homeschool their children and really can demonstrate that they're competent to homeschool their children and they will be doing that properly, um, then maybe the children don't need to be vaccinated. But if the children are going to be going to school, uh, I think it's reasonable to require that they be vaccinated irrespective of the parents' uh, views on, on, on that question. If we turn from children to, to adults, some researchers who have tried to figure out what really lies behind vaccine hesitancy have, have pointed out that there are a substantial number of, you know, minimum wage workers, um, typically minorities who, who make the calculation that they, they can't afford, you know, four or five days of missing work if they have, uh, relatively severe side effects from, from the vaccine, they, they don't get any sick pay and, uh, there's no, there's no safety net for them taking into account, you know, their, uh, their vulnerability and all of the, the 
systemic disparities that they may experience. Uh, what's, what's our responsibility to them? Should we say, nevertheless, the calculation comes out that you'd be better off taking the vaccine? Uh, or do you think that there's a, a social responsibility to indeed provide the kind of, of guarantees that our economy at, at the moment doesn't, at least to employees in, in, that, in that category? Uh, well, I support, um, you know, universal health coverage and, and, you know, universal unemployment benefits. Um, so in that sense, I think if people can show that they are unemployed, uh, whether as a result of, um, getting the vaccine, which I think I would, I would think four or five days off work because of, of getting vaccinated would be very unusual, but, um, uh, but if that does happen, um, I think we could certainly pay them benefits to compensate for their loss of income during that period. I think that would be the right thing to do for them and obviously would be an incentive to overcome some of that vaccine hesitancy that you mentioned and therefore would be, um, uh, have great benefits for the community. So, uh, yeah, I think that, that would be a, a reasonable step. Um, I should say that in Australia, by the way, people who, who were out of work because of the, uh, lockdowns, um, got, uh, got reasonable compensation for that, or their employers were given money to pay them, uh, even though they could not actually work. So, um, uh, it's, it's, it's dropping off now because of the length of, of time, but there was, um, uh, uh, quite good backup policy. And it's interesting because we, we have a conservative federal government, which normally would be against going into deficit, but in these circumstances, um, they judged that this was the necessary and right thing to do. Yeah. Going back to the mandates for a moment, I wonder whether or not you think the mandates could have a significant backlash effect. So people become more hesitant and perhaps they protest and the right thing to do would actually be to use nudges like incentives instead of sticks. Um, sure. I think, I think sticks are the last resort. Um, you know, coercion here is, is absolutely the last resort. And if there are nudges we can use and, uh, incentives, um, that, uh, we can manage that are, are not going to be too expensive, um, then definitely that's uh, a better way to do it. Um, but in the end, if, if that still doesn't work, um, then I think the mandates are justified. We we've had a question about, uh, an exemption for conscientiously held religious beliefs or, or perhaps for quote unquote, philosophical beliefs, which some jurisdictions have, have, uh, accepted as, as equivalent. Um, are there, is, is that, um, a, is that a persuasive argument to you that there ought to be an exempt category for call it conscientious objection to, to vaccination and how should one adjudicate it? So this may, this may sound, uh, harsh, but, uh, I think not, um, I'm not aware of any religion that, uh, both says you must go out and mix with other people and you can't get vaccinated. Um, you know, maybe there are some, I know that, uh, let's say among uh, Orthodox Jewish people, you're supposed to have 10, 10 people together for, uh, religious, uh, services, um, 10 men, I should say it's a sexist as well as, um, uh, requiring that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, if people do want to mix with others, then I think again, uh, it doesn't really make sense to allow, uh, exemptions, particularly exemptions that could then be used by a, a wider number of people. You know, I, I don't know that there may be a very small number of people who are adherence of a religion that says you can't get vaccinated. I'm, I'm not sure what it would be, as I say. Um, Peter, can I step in for just a second? So I actually know somebody who objects on religious grounds to getting the vaccination because of a concern about embryos used in the, in the research process. And so they're pretty ardently pro pro-life. And so they think that any sort of fetuses that have been killed uh, along the way sort of uh, makes it morally objectionable to, to make use of the vaccine. 
So of course, I know that that's not your view about the moral status of embryos, but in any case, you might think, well, maybe that's a reasonable view, uh, even though it's not one you hold, and we should, you know, make space for reasonable views to be held and to people for people to object uh, on reasonable grounds, even if they're false. Well, it's also not only not my view about the status of embryos, but it's also way back in the process, right? It's it's not like you know there are embryo cells going into your arm when you get the vaccination. This was at some uh, stage of the development when they were used. Um, uh, it reminds me of, of uh, George W. Bush's compromise on the use of stem cells, on the use of embryos to create stem cell lines, which was regarded as a promising medical technology. And uh, essentially his compromise there was not to say that you can't use stem cells developed from embryos at all, but rather to say, as of this date, when I, he gave a national televised address, as of this date, you can't use any new any any stem cell lines created from embryos that were used from this moment on so essentially he was saying what's past is past there's nothing you can do about that you're not making any difference to it um but you can't do it going forward and i i think that's you know that line would allow people to have vaccines that were developed if they were i'm not really fully across the facts on this um from uh, embryos at some point, but no further embryos are being used. Now, I, I agree that some people may not see it this way. They may say, well, some, I'm complicit in it if I ever use them. Uh, that seems to me to be a difficult position to justify morally, but people may hold it. Um, I, I look, I, 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 I don't have a really strong view on this. If there were a tiny number of people who held this view. Um, and didn't want to get vaccinated, um, you know, maybe you'd give them exemptions. Uh, I think it, it really depends on to what extent this is going to undermine, um, developing sufficient immunity for people to feel safe when they're mixing with other people. Yeah. Here, we've had a variety of, of questions on the theme of, uh, how do you actually do these calculations that you are, um, referring to? How do you, are, aren't they apples and oranges, lives lost, jobs lost, or how do you, how do you weigh the uh, fact that while older people, uh, are at much higher risk than younger people, they also have fewer years of life ahead. How can, how can a society get a, get a handle on this so that it, it understands both the, the principle behind it, but it can also engage in these calculations or is it something that we have to let the, uh, let the experts handle and, and inform us? Uh, well, the problem is that at the moment, um, we don't really have, uh, a lot of experts working on this. So what we're really talking about, I try, I think is the overall impact on the quality of life, uh, and the loss of life, of course, regarding, you know, death as zero quality of life and therefore the loss of the years of, of life that you would have lived at whatever quality you would have lived. We, we, I think that's what we should be trying to measure. Now there is some work going on in assessing, uh, the impact on quality of life of various, uh, illnesses and various conditions. Um, this is being done by, uh, health economists. Um, it's used, for example, in the United Kingdom to advise the National Health Service, which decides which health procedures it will reimburse, um, to, to decide whether it's worth, um, having, uh, and paying for particular procedures for people. So for example, suppose that you have a very expensive drug that extends somebody's life for a month. Is that worth it? Well, you do a calculation of what is the cost per quality adjusted life year. That's the term used, um, uh, gained by the drug and, uh, the national health service, given its budget constraints, uh, has a line at some point, uh, I don't know what it is today, but let's say it might be 50,000 pounds per quality adjusted life year. So we'll pay for something that is under 50,000 pounds per quality adjusted life year gained, and we won't pay for something that's over that. Um, so it is, it is a kind of healthcare rationing, um, um, but you have to do the calculations. Um, 
what I'm saying is we don't really have that for the wide range of costs and benefits, particularly the, uh, the, the non-health related costs that uh, relate to a lockdown. And I think there's a good case for saying we should be doing more research in this field. We need social scientists to talk to people about how much worse off do you think your life was during the lockdown because you couldn't work, um, or, you know, be, because you couldn't go out and do these favorite activities of yours. Um, and, uh, then we need to try to get some comparison between that and, uh, the costs of not having the lockdown. Uh, it's difficult to do. I, I know. And we don't, as I say, we don't really have the resources to do it and, to, and we haven't got the data gathered, but it's not in principle, completely impossible to do. Well, in the United States, our insurance companies do it a lot, don't they? And well, they do. That's right. There's... We, uh, many of us battle with them over their, their calculations, which, uh, just leads me back again to this matter of, can we expect the public in a democratic society to, um, to not battle uh, against these kinds of, of calculations when perhaps they turn out to be adverse to the, to the interests of the, of the individual and expect them to embrace the, the general utilitarian perspective that, that requires these things. Uh, well, it's interesting, isn't it? That in the United States, a lot of people have these, these battles about costs and with their private insurance companies. And maybe that's because they think these insurance companies are making profits where they shouldn't be. Um, whereas in the United Kingdom and, and in other countries that have national health services too, generally speaking, Australia is another example. Um, we don't really have that litigation and, and people accept that the government is making decisions as to how best to use taxpayers' money. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there's a different attitude and maybe the different attitude is related to the fact that you have private enterprise companies deciding that uh, here. Um, and you know, if, uh, Medicare is deciding it, maybe we don't have the same amount of litigation and protest and disagreement. Uh, so uh, that maybe that's just a, a, an inefficiency built into the US, uh, very complicated system, healthcare system in which there are so many private interests involved trying to profit off not paying people, um, what maybe in many cases they should be paying them. Well, that's, that's definitely a, an important topic for another webinar. Yeah, Rebecca. definitely. Yeah. I would love to jump back to the discussion about the quality adjusted life year principle, because as I'm sure, you know, there've been many critiques of using, um, colleagues in medical decisions. And I wonder if you think any of those critiques are compelling, right? Some of the critiques suggest that they're unfairly discriminatory and we should resist using that sort of a calculation mechanism. Yeah. Um, certainly there are critiques and some of those critiques have, um, a certain amount of validity and in fact, it, it gets back to the, the topic that I started on and that the protests are related to, because some people will argue that, um, if people have disabilities, their quality of life may be rated lower and therefore they may not get treatments that other people without those disabilities would get. So there's a kind of double jeopardy. Um, uh, and yeah, you could certainly sympathize with that. Um, so, uh, there are, there are issues, but, um, I still think that it's better to try to do something with qualities and maybe you can make adjustments at certain points, um, than it is just to say, you know, no, we're, we're not going to do it. We're going to leave it to, I don't know, the doctor's discretion or first come first served or whatever. I mean, those things don't work out very well either. They also typically will end up with more privileged people getting uh, more and better services. So, um, I still think we should be trying to find some way of working out what is the best use of our resources in the healthcare field. Right. And you could maintain that something like, uh, quality of life adjusted life years could still be used. It would just have to take into consideration, you know, critiques, for instance, from, you know, uh, folks in the disability rights community and others who challenge some of the quality of life assessments, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a discussion that we, we also need to have certainly. 
So Peter, we have a question here about uh, the vaccine mandates again. So as you mentioned, we don't want to hold people down and force them to get vaccinated. Instead, we want to use incentives and disincentives. Um, what do you think about the following proposal? Um, if hospitals were to announce, look, um, if we are, if, if we have all our uh, hands on deck and we're still overwhelmed, we're going to deprioritize the unvaccinated. Um, and that's a risk you run. Now, if we have all our resources on hand, we will treat everyone just the same. But um, you run this risk if you stay unvaccinated that you're going to be deprioritized when the hospitals are overwhelmed. Um, what do you think about a proposal like that? It's not intended to be punitive towards the unvaccinated. It's just a, just sort of a general uh, policy. And uh, I mean, the reason it's interesting is because it may be the case that treating an unvaccinated person actually uh, maximizes life years in this particular case. But a general policy may actually uh, of of deprioritizing the unvaccinated may actually you know produce more in terms of um, uh, overall life years. Yes, it's it, it is exactly that clash between a, a a policy that you have to be very hard hearted really to to implement to say that. Uh, so again, if we're talking about COVID patients, to say that we're going to take the patient who is at a lower risk of dying. Um, the vaccinated patient at a low risk of dying rather than the unvaccinated patient at a higher risk of dying. Um, if we're talking about people who are coming, wanting an ICU bed because of nothing to do with COVID, um, you know, then it would make sense, I think, to say, um, we'll take the people who are vaccinated, um, uh, because partly that will have lower risk for the healthcare workers, right? Because they're vaccinated, they're less likely to transmit the virus. Um, and, uh, although the you hope that the healthcare workers are vaccinated and now many states are mandating vaccination for healthcare workers. Um, still, there's still some risk that even when vaccinated, they will get the virus and, and it will mean that they can't work for some period of time. So you could justify it in that way. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough not to admit people to ICUs when, um, they're at greater risk of dying than other people that you are admitting. On, on that point about the unvaccinated uh, healthcare workers, extraordinarily, unpredictably, uh, they're, they're quitting their jobs in, in the United States, many quitting their jobs rather than get vaccinated. And doesn't that then pose a particular complication to a utilitarian? Because if you support the mandate, the hospitals are actually going to be less sustainable than they are now. So wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, uh, long range calculations suggest got to just pull back on, on the, on the mandate and keep those workers there. Otherwise patients are going to be worse off. More, more people will, will die. Is there an obvious utilitarian route through that particular problem? Uh, well, I suppose one question is whether, uh, the healthcare workers really are quitting. I know, um, just reading the last few days when the, cause the New York state mandate came in for healthcare workers to be vaccinated and there were headlines about, you know, hospitals are going to be short staffed. What are they going to do? Call in the national guard, whatever. Um, and then in the last couple of days, there was a huge rush of healthcare workers to get vaccinated. And the, the most recent reports I've seen suggest that there isn't going to be a serious staff shortage in New York state hospitals. Um, but you know, this could well be regional and that could be a different situation. So another option that uh, I've seen floated is, um, if you're not vaccinated, you have to wear the full personal protective gear equipment, um, and you have to have a daily COVID test, um, and continue to test negative in order to continue to work. Um, maybe that's a feasible alternative if there really is a risk of so many healthcare workers refusing vaccination that the hospitals uh, become seriously short staffed. Eric. Yeah. So Peter, uh, we're coming up towards the end of the hour. I don't know when you'll need to go, but I wondered, uh, there's a question here about, uh, getting perspective on the pandemic. So, um, let's see, stepping back for a bit. I'm wondering if you can help us put this pandemic in perspective. How do you think the COVID-19 pandemic ranks among the many problems confronting us today? Many of these problems you've worked on, Peter such as uh, global poverty, climate change, existential risk, animal welfare, and perhaps many other problems that we face? Uh, so um, I think that the pandemic is a lesser problem than, than those that you mentioned. Um, so certainly if we're talking about climate change, I think that's a huge problem 
which we have to grapple with, which is going to have long-term consequences uh, for uh, many millions of people. I, I think we're going to see many millions of people becoming climate refugees as a result of changes in climate. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, catastrophic consequences for, for a very long time to come. Of course, many deaths from extreme weather events as well. Uh, global poverty too. I think the number of people dying, um, because of, uh, global poverty is, uh, greater than the number of people dying from, from COVID, uh, and, uh, certainly they're younger people on average. So they're more life years lost if we calculate it that way too. Uh, so I would see that as a, a greater problem as well. Um, I think you raised animal suffering. Uh, it's, it's not easy to compare the suffering of non-human animals and humans, but, but the numbers are so great when we're talking about animals in factory farms, uh, we're talking about something like 70 billion animals in factory farms, uh, are, you know, raised and slaughtered each year. So, um, something like 10 times the world's human population. Uh, and those animals are typically leading miserable lives. So that's also a huge problem. I, you know, can I say that it's a greater problem than, than COVID, uh, 19? Well, without some good way of comparing the sufferings of cows and pigs and chickens, um, no, I probably can't really make a confident statement either way on that one, but it's, it's another huge problem. Peter, uh, as a final question. Do you think that the pandemic experience, uh, well, we still have some time actually. Yeah. Do you think the pandemic experience has, has made us in some ways, um, a better society, more moral, more humane, more aware of our diversity and the different ways in which suffering afflicts people or has it, has it made us, um, if not the opposite, um, has it, has it hardened our, um, our, our closed, our ranks, uh, you know, diminished our sense of, of social solidarity. Do you, do you have a, a rough judgment about, about the, the moral effects on ordinary people from all of the sorts of stresses that we've discussed this afternoon? Yeah. So I think that there has been some sense of solidarity within local communities. Um, there have been people who have uh, reached out and helped others at greater risk. Um, younger people helping older people offering to do their shopping for them so that the older people who are at greater risk would not be exposed to the virus. This was particularly of course, before we had the vaccines. Um, and I think, you know, those sorts of, of measures were good. Uh, on the other hand, I've already mentioned that. Uh, nothing changed in terms of our concern for people in low income countries and in, in poverty and other parts of the world. Um, so there was no global solidarity there. There was no reaching out that was significantly different from what we've been doing for a long time in terms of giving a small amount of aid, but, uh, not nearly as much as we could and should be doing. Uh, so, um. I don't think we're going to come out of the pandemic significantly different from the way we went into it. Maybe, maybe a little more community solidarity and fellow feeling, um, but not a great deal of, of difference in that. Becca. Yeah. On that point, we've spoken about how the problems of polarization and disinformation are pulling people further apart. And earlier you mentioned the Trump administration's failure to deal well with, uh, the, uh, with the pandemic. And I want to know whether you think that social media companies should take certain steps to regulate people's speech about COVID more or not. And what kinds of steps do you think they ought to take if that's the case? Yeah, I think, I think, um, fact checking speech and putting statements on speech that, um, this is factually false information. Um, if that can be done, um, uh, maybe, you know, when, when you have people who are constantly peddling false information about COVID and about the vaccine, um, just generally putting that marker on everything that they post, um, can be justified. Um, 
you know, as, as I said right at the beginning, I, I'm an advocate of free speech, which doesn't mean that I'm an advocate of uh, hate speech or racial vilification or anything like that. I'm an advocate of reasoned free speech um, that is defended on the basis of evidence and argument. And I don't think we should prevent people posting uh, that kind of view. So um, I'm not suggesting a, a blanket ban on people saying the vaccine is, is not a good idea or it's riskier than people are telling us that it is. Um, I think we, we should be able to have that kind of debate, but it should be a debate which people can fact check and see whether the information provided is demonstrably false. Um, or whether it's arguable, you know, it might not be right, but it might be arguable. Um, and so I would leave the arguable pieces of, of um, posts or essays, whatever they might be, blogs, um, I would leave them going up. Um, but the ones that are simply making statements that are, are, are demonstrably false, well, at, at the very least, I would, I would put a label on them indicating that. We've, we've covered a, a lot of ground, but I'm, I'm wondering whether there are any topics that we've ignored in your point of view that are of crucial importance that we, we should be aware of. Well, I, I, I will say one, one extra thing, and that is, uh, we've had this pandemic, um, we are having it, um, it, uh, very probably was the result of viruses spread from animals to humans. Um, there are different views as to whether it came out of the wet market of Wuhan, um, or whether it came out of a, a lab there. Um, and you know, we, I don't think we, we know the answer. Um, but it, it is a virus that came to humans from animals and, uh, the CDC in fact has, has said in, in general that. Um, about 70%, I think it is of, of new viruses, uh, come to humans from animals. Now, um, there are some sources that we can and should close down straight away, like this use of, of wild animals in, in wet markets. Um, that's a, an obvious risk. And these are disgraceful places anyway, where caged animals of different species that have lived in the wild, uh, sort of, you know, next to each other. Uh, their feces and urine is mixing on the floor. They're then slaughtered on the spot. Um, and their blood is mixing. Um, I think we should not have any tolerance for, for places like that. But the bigger issue is the factory farms that, uh, we have so many of, um, in this country and that supply the great majority of the meat that people are eating. Um, and people have warned for a long time that they are also places that produce viruses because you have 10,000, 20,000 animals in a single shed. They're crowded, they're stressed, their immune system is weakened. Um, and that's a perfect situation for breeding and spreading viruses. And the viruses will spread through the animals. They'll mutate as they go. Um, some mutations may be ones that can uh, latch onto receptors in humans. And you do have humans mixing with them. Of course, you have humans going through and, uh, you know, cleaning out the ones that die during their growing process or, um, uh, herding them up to go to slaughter, slaughtering them. Uh, so this is a huge pandemic risk and, uh, we really need to think about that and to do something about it. Um, you know, we've, in fact, the previous pandemic previous to COVID-19 was the swine flu pandemic of, uh, 2009. And, um, although that was less contagious and so didn't spread it, it killed, I think something over 300,000 people. Um, and, uh, it had quite a high, it, it was, it was quite dangerous. If you got it, you had quite a high fatality rate. So it's possible that the next virus to come out of a factory farm will both be highly contagious and highly lethal. And, and then we'd look back on COVID-19 and think, wow, that wasn't so bad. Um, so. Uh, I think we really need to think about, uh, this, about our use of animals in general. Of course, I, I do have other reasons for thinking we, we should rethink our use of animals in general. I don't think it's ethical to treat animals the way we do when we don't need to be raising them for food, uh, certainly not in, in factory farms, um, perhaps, you know, not at all. Um, uh, so I, I would like to see us rethinking that. And I think the pandemic 
uh, is an additional reason for doing so. And of course, we have climate change reasons for doing so too. We know this is a major contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So we've now got an additional reason for trying to halt the factory farming spread that we're uh, having. Yeah, on the topic of animal ethics, I came across a co-authored paper of yours recently on whether or not ethics classes influence student behavior and specifically the ethics of eating meat. Can you share with everyone the conclusions of that? Certainly, yeah. This was a paper uh, which the lead author was Eric Schwitzgabel at the University of California, Riverside. Um, and uh, the third co-author was Brad Koklot, who's now in Kansas. Um, and it, it's, I think, the first time that it's been properly demonstrated in a controlled, randomized trial that a philosophy class affects people's behavior, not in the lab, but in the real world. Uh, and, and, you know, we were fortunate that uh, Eric saw the opportunity for this kind of study design at UC Riverside, where um, most of the students buy their meals at the university cafeteria and they use their ID cards to purchase the meals. And the meals uh, indicate the, uh, the cafeteria records show what they purchased. So, uh, Eric had the idea of taking a large philosophy class, um, and, uh, randomly assigning some of the students to, uh, a stream in which one week they had a discussion of the ethics of eating meat, just one week, just one discussion. Um, and the others had a discussion of the ethics of donating to charity. And that was the control. Uh, there wasn't any way of working out whether the students did donate to charity after that class, but there was a way of working out whether the ones in the meat ethics group. Uh, ordered less meat at the student cafeteria. Uh, and the study showed, um, somewhat to Eric's surprise, I should say, because he's written previously skeptical stuff about the effect of philosophy teaching. Um, but, uh, to my gratification and I think Brad's as well, but to Eric's surprise, but you know, we actually got a statistically significant difference in the, in the amount of meat consumed by the students in the meat ethics stream. It wasn't, it wasn't like they all became vegetarians or anything like that. It wasn't huge. But, uh, there was a, a detectable drop in that, uh, and we've now run a second study. Incidentally, that study was published in cognition. Um, uh, we've now run a second study, which we're submitting, um, uh, which replicates the results and again, finds a, a small, but statistically significant difference. More time. I think philosophers can be pleased by that. You know, we do have an impact on the world, even, even just with one hour of teaching. Right more topics for, uh, future discussions. You're, you're well known for saying that, um, you're not, you're not that interested in, in metaphysical questions, which, uh, hurts the feelings of some of my colleagues, uh, as you are in the practical bringing philosophy to the practical dimensions of, of life. And I think you've demonstrated, uh, how that is, that is an unavoidable fact this afternoon. This has been a stimulating and educative discussion, and I'm glad we we had it. Those who oppose your participation uh, admonished us to be mindful of our college's commitment to diversity and, and inclusion. And we think that we, we are, but we also welcome those who, uh, all those who are committed to truth seeking and who acknowledge the requirement of offering reasons for arguments and, and answering objections. That's how I think we interpret the principle of inclusion and in what is primarily a knowledge community. And I think it's, it's that reason why we resisted the demand to exclude you from today's conversation. And I hope our friends who disagree with us will, um, will think about our, our reasons and, and we look forward to talking to them in the future about it. Thank you, Peter Singer, Rebecca Tuvel. Eric Sampson, and thanks to all of you who, who attended and asked such great questions. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks for putting it on. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you went ahead with it. And let me just say that if there are discussions ongoing with the people who criticized you, um, I'd be, I'd be happy to take part in those and try to sort out some of the issues that are raised. Thank you. Thank you.